It's a great pleasure to talk to you from lockdown England in Hazel Grove in Cheshire near Manchester about the wonderful Ludwig van Beethoven. It's incredible to think that this is the 250th birthday of this great icon. Where would we be without Beethoven? Life without Beethoven is unimaginable. He's this enormous icon, this great figure who has produced so many works that we all love and adore. And it's not just our generation, it's generation upon generation upon generation that has nurtured, cherished and been inspired by the tremendous music of this iconic figure. However, I do think there's a danger that because Beethoven is so great and so famous, that we think of him almost as though he's a statue in marble. We can idolize and treat Beethoven as an icon and forget about the supremely human, mischievous, childlike, naive qualities that are an essential aspect, not only of his nature, but I would argue of the nature of all artists. The adolescent spirit, the spirit of freedom, the spirit of lack of inhibition is so important to get to peak experience. As soon as we become worried about what others are thinking about us or what people might say, we lose the plot completely. When you want to get into peak experience, when you want to feel that you are absolutely floating and sailing, oozing out of creativity or confidence, you have a sense of losing yourself and your ego in the music. And I think that that's always important for young pianists, particularly in the 21st century, where it's so easy to access so many wonderful, legendary performances of Beethoven that are great. I think it's very important for um, young pianists not to lose that sense of peak experience and forgetting about the traditions of Beethoven, what X, Y, and Z do in a certain passage. Forget about all that and go with the music. And remember that Beethoven, the spirit of Beethoven, is the spirit of youth and discovery, as well as being um, a great, um, huge, wonderful legacy um, for humanity um, to show as one of the great peaks of achievement. I mean, it has been said by Louis Kettner, who was incidentally the first president of EPTA UK um, and the brother-in-law of Yehudi Menuhin, the violinist, great pianist Yehudi Menuhin say, said in his book on the piano that, you know, if you're going to take a group of works or some kind of collection of cultural achievement and put them in a spaceship, send them off to a foreign uh, planet, a, a way distances in another galaxy, as proof of how amazing mankind is. One of the greatest, strongest candidates for inclusion in that spaceship would not only be the works of Shakespeare, but the, the Beethoven piano sonatas. They stand up there as a huge achievement of what is possible by humankind. And um, I don't want to lose that at all. But, and I don't want to lose the feeling of responsibility either. The idea of the musician being a curator at a museum. That's something that was explored a lot in Alfred Brendel's first book, Musical Thoughts and Afterthoughts. And it is very much a strong tradition of interpretation and of piano pedagogy internationally, particularly since the Second World War. Prior to the Second World War, it wasn't uncommon for great pianists to sometimes play only two movements of the Hammerklavier in a concert. Ferruccio Busoni often only played the fugue and the, the introduction, or the first movement and the slow movement. Franz Liszt went even more uh, extreme in that he would sometimes mix different sonatas um, together, movements from different sonatas into a kind of pot pourri of Beethoven sonatas. That approach would have been thought hideous by many pedagogues and still is thought hideous by many pedagogues today, but certainly in the 1945 to 2000 era, with the advent of wonderful editions like Henley, which I've got here, of course, Henley, and there's 
universal um, Artex, the red orange edition from Vienna, which is wonderful, which I've also got next door, um, and other editions. Um, this one from England, from ABRSM, from Barry Cooper, the man who um, completed Beethoven's 10th symphony and produced editions of the re revised version of the Beethoven Violin Concerto and another version of the Fourth Piano Concerto and found bagatelles that had never been discovered until the 1980s and 90s. And most recently, from Baron Reuter, the Jonathan Del Mar edition. Um, which just has appeared in its complete form in 2020, in time for the 200th anniversary. So, of course, these editions and the, the values of those editions would go against the idea of mixing up different movements. And the curator of the museum idea reaches its perhaps apotheosis, I would say, in the new Jonathan Del Mar edition, where there is another volume in addition to the three books of... Um, text in which the entire book explains the editorial reasoning behind decisions in the text, whether to put um, a, nat a, a natural or a flat um, in place with the A uh, or the A sharp at the crucial moment of the, the climax of the development in the first movement of the Opus 106 clave, Hammer Clavier B flat Sonata, for example. So that kind of value is important. And my goodness me, it is a fantastic discipline, isn't it? I mean, to be a really good museum curator as a pianist when you're playing a work like Opus 110 at Beethoven is a tremendously hard job just to reproduce and to do all the markings on the score takes a tremendous amount of effort and time to memorize all the markings in the recitative of Opus 110 on one page alone is an extremely difficult thing to achieve. And if you can get a student or a pianist to have that kind of oral photography where every marking is faithfully reproduced in the performance, then that has to be applauded and admired. It's a great achievement. You know, I sometimes think, and I think that Brendel in his book, Musical Thoughts and Afterthoughts, said that one of the greatest attributes a Beethoven player can have is the ability to see visually the score in front of them as they play, almost as though the pianist is looking at a landscape and seeing the whole terrain of all the mountains and the valleys all laid out in music, being able to see it all. I have to say, that like Brendel, my visual memory is not my strongest point. Um, I think Brendel said in an interview that he had very good oral and physical memory and analytical memory. But um, I think, you know, being able to visualize the music is always extremely difficult for me. Now, that's not necessarily what the priorities were in the period of Hans von Bülow, who incidentally was the first pianist to play all of the 32 sonatas. Um, it's not necessarily the values that were in place um, in the early 20th century. Um, however, it is interesting that Ferruccio Busoni, who Claudio Arrau said would metaphorically rape Chopin in terms of what he did and um, adjusting the score in Liszt and other composers, with Beethoven was generally extremely faithful. And um, I think Ronald Stevenson, the, the late composer, pianist, and Busoni expert said that for Busoni, Beethoven was like scripture. And having that kind of respect for the notes is extremely important. Nevertheless, Klemperer, in his accounts of Busoni's playing, said that once in Switzerland during the First World War, he experimented, Busoni experimented by playing the entire finale of Opus 106 pianissimo, as though the music was in a shadow. What an extraordinary thing to do. And how apoplectic musicologists and curators of museums would be to hear that Hammer Clavier played um, without the, um, any kind of attempt to reproduce the 40s and the gradations of dynamic above pianissimo that proliferate that most complex score. Well, this is the point of what I'm trying to get to in this talk, is Beethoven as a youthful spirit. But I also think we have to think about Beethoven and his place 
in the early years of learning the piano and appreciating music? Well, you know, when I was a kid in Scotland in the 70s, um, music was a part of the general state school education. I remember at primary school watching a Walt Disney film about Beethoven, and the whole class were generally, gen genuinely and generally very interested. The story of a man who became deaf and was a musician and could no longer hear what he was playing uh, is a very powerful story for a child. It's a very powerful story for us all, and we should never forget how remarkable the Beethoven life story is, and all the sadnesses, the testament, the trouble with his nephew, the, um, the, the lack of fulfillment, the terms of falling in love with the wrong people. The whole uh, package is extremely moving. And the fact that he was able to transcend all of his unhappiness and difficulties and become the first musical superstar to do what Mozart was unable to do, to actually transcend the patronage system and stand on his own feet as an artist, even if he did have to dedicate works to the Archduke Rudolf and so on, and members of the aristocracy. Um, it is a tremendous, um, real motivating example for us all. Um, so it captures the imagination of youth, but I think there's more to it than that. I mean, Beethoven always um, surprises and alerts us in his style. You know, somebody once said he was a very noisy composer. I think um, the, the, the ability to suddenly switch off all the lights in his music is incredible. And it's one of the, the traits that goes through all his work. And it's, it's, it's kind of playing with nature and the order of things. And that's a very youthful kind of quality that young people, as well as old, we all tend to admire the impiness of it all. The fact that you get so often in, in Beethoven, you get sudden drops in dynamics that you're going, example, but there are others when you're going along and having the courage, the courage to drop the dynamic is very like just turning off the lights and turning them on again. Daniel Barenboim in an essay said that it takes a lot of courage for a performer to literally drop down a dynamic and I'm sure a lot of teachers would agree with me that it's extraordinary how common uh, the inability for students to do these sudden dynamic drops um, is, you know, with lots of different students of different backgrounds, they all find it very hard to turn the light off like that. Um, but Beethoven, of course, is not just that, it's every single aspect of music that has a youthful quality to it, a sense of defying what's expected, defying the order. Whether it's putting accents in the wrong place, da, 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 bum, 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 putting an accent on the weak beat, going against what we expect. That gruffness, that extremities, that these incredible contrasts. And um, the youthful spirit of Beethoven continues in every aspect you look at. In the middle period, Glenn Gould got very um, agitated in a quite humorous way in a couple of essays he wrote. One was Glenn Gould interviews Glenn Gould about Beethoven. And he was really, you know, tongue in cheek saying that actually the Appassionata is a very bad piece. <laughs> we all look up in horror at this um, blasphemy. Um, but what he was saying was that in his opinion, Beethoven became so tied up with proving that he could write great masterpieces with the most insignificant, trite material imaginable, that it became a kind of an egotistical thing. I would disagree. I would say, rather, as Schoenberg did, that it's not about the material that you use to create a sonata, composing to put together. It's more a case of what you do with the material. You know, Peter, Sir Peter Maxwell Davis, British composer, once said, if I get stuck for inspiration for a piece, I look up the telephone book. What he meant was he got a number, and you can go, I don't know, you know, six, 
four, two, seven, and write a piece based on a telephone number. Um, Beethoven takes that, you know, uh, kind of to an extreme. I mean, who would have thought that one of the most sublime pieces of all time is the Beethoven violin concerto? You know, using you know absolute childlike, youthful, not even youthful. You know, kindergarten. Any little two-year-old can go boom, 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 boom. But then again, one of my colleagues in Manchester, Jonathan Middleton, um, pointed out to me um, that he'd been through all of the Beethoven sonatas and found somewhere in every one that figure from the Fifth Symphony. It comes in the very first piano sonata, after all. And it comes everywhere. You know, it's almost like Alfred Hitchcock wanting to always appear somewhere in a crowd scene in one of his films. Um, it's a kind of uh, trademark. Is this Beethoven being um, rather um, mischievous? I don't think so. I think, I think, you know, that kind of fate motive is not a mischievous figure, but to put it everywhere and to actually, for Jonathan to have found it everywhere, is quite extraordinary. Um, and I think the defiance, you know, the, the qualities we associate with teenagers, with attitude, come a lot into Beethoven and should never be downplayed in the spirit of reverence for icons. And we're talking about turning the lights off of the dynamics, putting the accents in the wrong place. We're talking in terms of the evolution of the piano, of Beethoven stretching and stretching the possibilities, breaking strings as he became deaf, being incredibly quiet, incredibly loud when he played, being always wanting more and more. Don't teenagers nowadays want more and more? Don't they want designer labels, gym shoes, trainers, um, the best um, iPhone, iPhone 12, the iPhone 29, whatever. They want more and more. Beethoven wanted these pianos to do more and more and became more and more frustrated. And maybe Broadwood met his, met his match, Beethoven met his match with Broadwood in the end, but he was always pushing it, wanting extra notes. Isn't it frustrating when we hear in Opus 10, number three, and what he really wanted to write was, he brought the notes beyond his piano. We can sense them pushing it. I personally think it's actually quite good interpretively not to play notes lower than Beethoven's piano, but actually to try to feel that you're about to explode with frustration at those points. Da -da 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 -da. And I think that's part and parcel of the excitement. It's this idea of somebody pushing and pushing and pushing. As I say, very defiant, you know, somebody with attitude. This is our, you know, pop star in Vienna, making his mark, pushing society, working on his own, away from the patronage system, and making the piano, forcing alongside his disabilities and his frustrations at not being able to play anymore, pushing the technology of the piano forward into this incredible instrument that we know today. Um, every aspect of the music, the structure reconsider, the colors, um, you know, and so when students, you know, and they do sometimes say, oh, I don't want to play the pathetique because everybody does. I get extremely sad because this is music that is constantly reinventing itself, constantly discovering itself anew. I mean, you know, we can do all kinds of things. And you know, it's not a case of doing things one way and saying that is the right way to do it. For some people will say that. It's a case of doing something with conviction to the extent that everybody else will believe it. And for that moment in time, making it the right thing to do. But the youthful spirit of Beethoven is such that he keeps on reinventing himself. I mean, typical example to take. Um, very, uh, here's a few that, that may be raising a few eyebrows. I mean, the Pathetique Sonata, 
We don't actually know for certain that the repeat sound comes after the introduction. So, once you've done... Once you've done next position... some people will say you should start from the, the second page but that first chord of the pathetique you know you can be like Alfred Brendel and you can sit at it or you can be like Brendel's teacher Edwin Fisher or Andra Schiff and you can try and do a diminuendo by fluttering your foot and lifting the hand up and down what you do. You can try and have um, a very, very mathematical ratio between the first page and the second page. One, two, three. Or you can go against that and not do that. I mean, there is some evidence, Professor Barry Cooper has said, that in the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven didn't actually want a ratio connection between one part and another part of the symphony and you could argue therefore that it's wrong to superimpose a ratio connection there. What I would say is nothing is wrong if it's done with a youthful spirit. <coughs> By that I mean if you get into the habit of routine, if you get into the habit of predictability, you're not in the world of Ludwig van Beethoven. You're in the world of routine and predictability and sedentary middle age. We want Beethoven to be dynamically youthful, charged up at every age. Isn't it wonderful that Horzowski was still playing Opus 2, number 2, with much better fingers than I could ever hope to have at the age of 98? <laughs> Managing these amazing runs in Wigmore Hall um, in his late 90s. That's the Beethoven spirit of youth. Um, of course, you know, you can't expect six year olds to begin playing Opus 110 when they're very young. Although it has to be said that Buzzoni, um, before he was 10, had played Opus 110 public, Norma Fisher played Opus 111 when she was. Um, 11 years of age in London. And lots of pianists have done these things, but back to the basics, you know, there's all sorts of amazing, easy pieces that can be played. I mean, we all adore Furelis, wonderful bagatelle, and so many of these bagatelles. I mean, in Britain, if you say, oh, it's just a mere bagatelle, as Noel Coward would say in Private Lives or one of his plays. If you say that, it means it's, it's not important. It's something that can be thrown off without concern. Um, and the ability to play these pieces with all their different moods and yet throw them off with a spirit of improvisatory confidence, however you do throw them off, is extremely charming and affecting and beautiful and important. I mean, with Beethoven's bagatelles, the youthful spirit really reaches a new level because we keep on finding more and more bagatelles. There used to be a, a website called The Unknown Beethoven. Barry Cooper found three new bagatelles by Beethoven lying inside the manuscript of the Missa Solemnis that people had forgotten about even existing for generation after generation. I was very lucky enough to give the world premiere of those three in Aberdeen University in 1989. It was broadcast on BBC Radio 4, a world premiere of Beethoven. But that's not a unique case. Barry found many more, and other commentators have found many bagatelles. Beethoven was constantly writing. And that spirit of never feeling that we really know how many works Beethoven actually wrote is very youthful and very um, reinvigorating. Um, but you know, as well as doing the bagatelles, as well as playing for release, don't forget the works that may or may not have been written by Beethoven. I'm thinking about. <laughs> may not have been 
that have actually been, who cares? I mean, they're part and parcel of the young person's development, very important. All the sets of variations. How audacious and outrageous to write variations on Rule Britannia and God Save the Queen. And how wonderful to get young children to do this. Um, in lockdown at Cheatham School of Music, I managed to get our 10 and 11 year old pianists to learn a variation each from the Rule Britannia and God Save the Queen Beethoven variations and put it together in a kind of musical relay race. It's a really enjoyable experience for them and a lot of fun. Um, and there is so much fun in Beethoven. So many wonderful pieces that are never played. And so they remain youthful in, our, in the terms of reputation, like the Polonaise. Um, like the fantasy in G minor, the beautiful rondo in C, which is so um, absolutely moving. Yeah. And all the, the wonderful qualities that we so admire and take for granted when we're young, such as strength and, um, and um, strength and positivity. And all the qualities that, that we search for, perhaps if we're feeling less than confident in youth, come to their own in Beethoven's strength and velocity and athleticism, as well as a sense of positivity. All these amazing attributes, which are of course very, very important to develop at the youngest possible age for a happy, healthy life, are all there. I would say for the what I find really interesting is the way that our perceptions of this music can constantly and should consciously change as generation follows generation, as performer follows performer. But even, you know, amongst myself, you know, playing these works over and over again, finding new possibilities, new approaches, taking different tempos, taking different fingerings, different voicings, different characterizations. That's what music is all about. That's what keeps us going. You don't need to learn all 32 Beethoven sonatas, but you can and you should have at least 32 different approaches for each one of them as time goes on. The very idea of talking about 32 Beethoven sonatas is anathema to Professor Barry Cooper as well, because of course it wasn't Beethoven who said he wrote 32, it was Carl Cherney who started this. I mean, the other sonatas, um, which will remain very unknown and still remain particularly youthful. I mean, the F minor, the A minor, they're big works. That one of the variation is, you know, 20 minutes plus, just as significant as the Opus 49 sonatas. Why do we not include them? It's crazy. So really, we've got 35 sonatas, and already it's sounding very, very new and youthful rather than something that's kind of set in stone at 32. And then all the different interpretations, I would never ever reject the Buzzoni um, shadow approach of the hammer clavier. I mean, in a sense, people like Buzzoni expected the audiences to already know the conventional approach. And, you know, taking the Beethoven and putting it in a shadow um, may seem blasphemous in terms of museum curating, but it's actually looking beyond the composer and looking at the spirit of music itself. It used to be the case in international competitions that juries would be sitting with their heads cowed down at the scores, following every marking and pouncing, as it were, when a candidate on the stage wouldn't follow exactly what was on the text. Interestingly enough, at the last Leeds International Piano Competition, none of the jury um, were looking at Beethoven sonata scores when it was being marked. And at the Queen Elizabeth competition, um, the only person looking at the text while performers were playing was the British judi adjudicator. The other ones weren't. So, you know, perhaps times have changed a little bit from this obsession of oral photography, great, admirable um, uh, uh, discipline, though it is. I would actually look back at some of those horrific editions, horrific in inverted commas, and get great inspiration. When I was a student, um, by chance, one of my friends, a cellist, lent me his edition of the Shermer edition of Beethoven Sonatas, which is actually the Hans von Bülow edition. Now, it was horrendous in terms of changing the notes, changing the phrasing, changing the pedaling, but 
I was absolutely thrilled by laser jeu that I was studying at the time and the amazing fingering that it contained. Um, I really took the book and, and asked the cellist if I could if I could actually take it from him permanently, which he was a bit reluctant to do, but he gave it to me then. And I'm very glad because I went through and got amazing fingering from Hans von Bülow, which I use to this, this present day. And I was very interested to read an interview that Emmanuel Axe mentioned Hans von Bülow's edition for the fingering as well. Um, you can look at that edition and you can be an old woman and get very horrified by it, or you can be a youthful, teenage rebel and take that edition in both hands and say, wow, man, I'm going to use what I can from this geezer from the past. And that's the way it should be, taking the old and making it the new. Um, this new edition this year, particularly from Baron Reuter, is very special in that it's the only Urtex edition I know that doesn't include any fingering from anybody else other than from Beethoven. And that's, you know, even in Henley and even in some of the other ones that I could mention, they do include fingering suggestions. And I think it's a commercial reason. Uh, but it's interesting that, you know, we've got a new perspective of Beethoven from actually completely blanking out everybody else in this centenary year, which is fascinating. Um, so I would say always rethink, you know, the score. And Beethoven will allow infinite possibilities of rethinking. Beethoven remains the eternal youth. When you are learning a sonata, there are inevitably three kind of stages you go through. Um, you know, I think it's very interesting to have a pre-stage of learning where you're actually just coming to terms with the music inside you. You're going away from recordings and you may be just playing through and savoring and getting an overall feel for it, not worrying about fingering or anything like that, just getting a sense of discovery. And then gradually, you know, the next stage would be, you know, sharpening up things, tidying up things, taking the proverbial hoover, as it were, the vacuum cleaner, and making an oral photography session out of the sonata, you know, so that every page you play can be really absolutely pristine. Going through that kind of post-1945 urtext, um, post-Hiroshima, I was going to say, but post-1945 um, purist urtext uh, museum curating stage is a very challenging one. It has to be done in a spirit of positivity and not of pain. But then you want to get beyond that. You know, the notes themselves are not enough. Beethoven, we have accounts of him getting very annoyed with Czerny and others for changing his conception of the work by muddling around with the big important things like the big colours, the big tempos, the, the big picture. But he didn't care ever about the minutia, the accuracy, how, how proficient your proverbial chops are, as it were. And so when you get to stage three, the transcendental stage, this is when the spirit of youth has to come into its own. We have to be so um, prepared that the notes themselves are distilled and digested inside us. That's why I think practicing away from the piano is so important. Once the notes are inside you, then you can forget them. You know that what you are doing is nourished on hours upon hours of reflection and thought, and you can let go and you can have a youthful spirit. You can be the Peter Pan of the piano, as we all should be striving to be. We should never get old. We do not become bogged down, tired, exhausted. We become elated. We fly, we transcend above the difficulties. That's when Beethoven becomes the youthful composer for all time.